Welcome everyone. We're gonna let folks make their way in from the waiting room and we will get started in just a moment. What's going on everybody? Should I not have my video on? You're just gonna talk. No, first. you're good. Okay, let's, let's do this. Procedure this way. Let's do this. We are here with Nick Lund, a.k.a. Hey. The Birdist. Yay! We are going to talk about birds today, and we are so glad you are all with us. Nationwide, as many as 988 million birds every year die after hitting glass windows. It is such a bummer. I want it's people to know bummer. on the call, I'm I'm audibling a little bit. Yes. It's been a long week for everyone. It's been a long everything for everyone. So I, I'm 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 spinning the presentation today a little more positively because this is we're in early April. This is this is the time that birders dream of all year. This is it. Every day there are new species coming. Things are happening, so I, I, I'm gonna I'm gonna talk about some some real things at the end. I'm talking about real things. I'm not making anything up. I'm gonna, I mean, I'm talking about some sort of serious things uh, at the end. Um, at the uh, at the beginning, we're gonna talk about spring migration. Get excited for spring migration because it's happening right now. Awesome. Thank you, Nick. Yep. Nick is the advocacy and outreach manager at Maine Audubon. He knows so much about birds. He also manages Bird Safe Maine, which is a partnership between Maine Audubon, the Portland Society for Architecture and the University of Southern Maine, with the goal of making sure that our feathered friends are safe out there in our world, um, in their world. So Nick is also a frequent flyer on our Lunch and Learn program, and we always love to have him with us. We will roll with whatever uh, bird related news he's got for us today. Thank you all for joining us. I am Kathleen Neal. I am the Senior Director of Policy and Partnerships at Maine Conservation Voters and Maine Conservation Alliance. Our organizations represent more than 13,000 members and supporters dedicated to protecting Maine's environment and our democracy. MCA does that through education, collaboration, and advocacy an MCV by influencing public policy, holding politicians accountable, and winning elections. This Lunch and Learn space is an opportunity for us to dig into both of those missions and all of those activities, and it is absolutely one of my favorite parts of the week every week. So thank you for being with us. We are going to turn things over to Nick in just a moment. You are going to have a lot of amazing ideas and, and questions as he talks, I'm sure you can send those to me through the chat whenever they occur to you, and I'll keep them, keep track and make sure we get a chance to ask as many of them as possible when the presentation is over. Uh, if you have any technical difficulties today, Will Sedlak is the one to help you out, and you can message him directly through the chat. This event is going to be recorded. The video will be sent to all of you later this afternoon in a follow-up email. It will also be posted on our website where you can find tons of other Lunch and Learn recordings, including a couple featuring Nick. So have fun. Thank you for joining us. And Nick, the floor is yours. Hello. Top of the morning to you out there. Let me get started by sharing my screen. Everybody see that okay, Kath Kathleen? Good. I think we're Looks good. That's great. Good morning, everyone. It's me, Nick Lund. I am the uh, advocacy and outreach manager for Maine Audubon, uh, writer and author, uh, countryman, friend to all of you out there. Today, we're going to be talking about a couple of things. I uh, Here's the slide I have to show of my own face standing in a field in Washington, D.C. Um, let me go back to this one, though. This title, this program was titled birds in the built environment. And we will be talking about that. But as I gave some folks a heads up, it's that it's it can be heavy. And that's and we'll get to some heavy stuff later, but I want to get to some light stuff too. It's been a long week. It's been a long stretch for folks. This is early April. Early April is the time that birders like me wait for all year round. 
because because we can even though if there's still snow on my backyard out there it's spring is here and it is coming closer and closer every single day and that means birds are coming birds that were not here all winter long birds beautiful birds that fled the the dreariness of winter are now trickling back in this is the time that we are waiting for and so i'm going to talk a little bit when we start about this spring migration twirl around because it is time to for joy and happiness and we all need a little bit more of that in our lives so i'm going to talk about spring migration i'm going to talk about birds i'm talking about how you can get your backyard ready then i'm talking about what it what it means for a bird to navigate through the world of spring migration and of other times and let me give you a little insight a little sneak peek into what it's like to be a birder this is a text message that i got this morning from my buddy ed jenkins a biologist at uh, bri this is what we do i, I woke up to this and he said tres and gupwa. I know that is code for tree swallow and yellow palm warbler. These are two spring birds. These are birds that we wait for all year round. And birders like me, they, they eagerly anticipate, they, they, we, we go out in our backyards every morning and see what new birds have shown up. Ed lives over near Highland Lake in Falmouth. It's an awesome birding spot. And he's got tree swallows already. He's got palm warblers already. These are two of our early migrants bearing the torch for billions of other birds. Look at this. This is what we're doing. This is what we're doing right now. This is the United States. Um, and every spring, billions of birds fly up from the south. That could be the southern U.S. It could be the Caribbean. It could be Mexico. It could be South America and make their way north into the United States. And then about two and a half billion of those continue on up north into the uh, Canada, Maine, you name it, uh, continue on north. These uh, estimates of how many total birds in the United States, it's about 10 billion, I'd say. So migrants make up a big chunk of that, migrant birds, but there are a, a, a number of additional birds, resident birds, other birds like that that are sort of not covered here, seabirds and things. Um, uh, uh, about 10 billion total is the estimate. Billions of those are flying right now, every single night, from parts south to parts north. It's pretty awesome. And birders over time have gotten really good at uh, figuring out when they're coming and preparing for it. Um, this is a bird that you may hear right outside your window right now, your door, wherever you are, that was not here a couple of days ago. Eastern Phoebe. So we are still in the early part of migration. I'll talk about what that means in a minute. But we're still in the early part. There's still snow around, still, still pretty cold. Birds aren't all here yet. Eastern Phoebe, this beautiful little flycatcher, is one of these uh, earliest birds to come up. So this is a map from eBird. eBird is the bird sighting database that all birders use. They have got so many different sightings in now that they can make these incredible, incredibly detailed maps of how birds move and when exactly they move and where exactly they move. This is their map for uh, Eastern Phoebe. And we're starting here, you can see um, over here, we're starting in January. We go through the months here, we're starting in January. So Eastern Phoebe is, they don't winter that far south, right? So they hang out as far south, uh, you know, as far north as Southern New Jersey, and then through the Southeastern states in the winter. But let's follow here, I'm gonna press play. We're gonna follow this as they move up. So we're in February, March, boom coming on north. They spread out to new territories, and then September, October, November, boom, all the way down south. This is a map built on uh, exact data points from thousands and millions of different birders around the country, um, but this is how it goes. And let's look again, because let's watch where we are. Let's watch April. Ready? Now, flooding up. And you can see just in the first and second week of April, these birds come crashing back into Maine. And it's wonderful, because they, uh, they are loud, uh, and you can hear them and you can see them. They, for those of you who, who don't know what they sound like, they say their name. They're called a Phoebe because they say Phoebe. So if you're out there listening, uh, and let me, all of us know, after that dead, quiet winter, it's loud out there now. Birds are starting to sing and call and talk to each other. It's a good time. But if, if among that chorus you hear Phoebe, 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 that's an Eastern Phoebe and they're back. They also flick their tails when they sit on things. So you may see them that way. Here's a, gra here's a graphic representation of how this works. This is an, a, a chart showing uh, Eastern Phoebes in Maine by week by week. And you can see right here, here is where like April starts, I guess the end of March, way back up right here. So some of these birds are migrants and move through. And so there's a bit dip in the summer. Also, 
a lot of these maps show dips in the summertime. That's not necessarily because they're not here anymore. It's because they are harder to detect in summer. When birds are coming in the spring, they are vocalizing and they're singing to each other and they're loud and you know that they're there. Once they nest and have babies, they're not singing anymore. And so they're a little harder to detect. And so that's why sometimes there's this trough here. And then in fall migration, you see them again. But this is where we are, top of the pyramid. Good time. It's a good time to be here. They're not the only ones who do it. Here's another wood. Here's a, another bird. This is called a wood thrush. Uh, we have like six or seven or so different thrush species in Maine. Um, they are closely related to robins. They they're basically the size and the shape of the robin. This is a very beautiful one. Um, a, the wood thrush. Um, they don't winter in the United States. They winter down in Central uh, America. One thing, a couple of cool things to notice about this map. I'm going to put. First of all, is notice the difference between their um, how much smaller their wintering range is than their eventual breeding range. Birds in the winter time, especially when they um, spend the winters down in, in Central America, are squeezed into a much tighter place than they are in North America. Uh, and for all, for conservation purposes, that's really important because you want to make sure to protect these areas because they have sort of an outsized importance. Second is once I press play, watch this area right here. So watch like northern Texas uh, into lower Rio Grande Valley in Texas. You'll see. Let's see how many birds migrate there. Let's play, I'm gonna play this bad boy. Here we go, January, March, April, May, boom, up in. So they're a little bit later of a migrant. The thing to keep note of is they, oh, there's no birds in this Southern Texas area. They don't go here at all. All these birds and many species like them collect in the Yucatan and then just jump over the Gulf of Mexico. It's pretty crazy. They all fly at night, nonstop all the way over to uh, High Island or uh, uh, places on the Mississippi coast that are eluding my memory right now. But pretty cool migration. Here's another map showing um, wood thrushes in Maine. They're gonna come about early May. A lot of our migration, a lot of our neotropical passerine migration picks up in mid-May. We'll talk about why in a little bit. But um, so once mid-May comes, boom, we're at the top of the pyramid for wood thrush. These are the real gems. They're all great, but these are gems too. These are warblers. Warblers are a, a group of like in Maine, 25 or so different brightly colored, small insect eating birds. They are like the, uh, just the Christmas tree ornaments of East Coast birding. They all have their different bright patterns that they wear in the spring. They all have different calls and habits and habitats and things. And so um, watching these colorful birds come in in the spring is the absolute joy. And it's sort of, we're sort of the envy of the world in that respect for a lot of people. Um, let's go down the line. These are just a small sample of the ones that we can see here in Maine. This is a black-throated green warbler, a yellow warbler in the top, a Cape May warbler named after a place in New Jersey it was seen. They don't even live there. They just sort of pass through. Black-throated blue warbler and a black and white warbler beauties. They also come around early May. Look at this chart. Nothing, 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 nothing. Gaboosh all the way up to the top here in mid-May. Cape May warbler traditionally is sort of the, the rarest of the bunch um, with the lowest. With, uh, black and whites are very ob obvious and evident. Um, they're coming, man. They're coming. So let's get excited. Um, of course, there are not, they are not the only birds that migrate. Lots of different birds migrate. Common loons, right? Um, common loons migrate, but not for the same reason that the other birds migrate, which is for food. They migrate, migrate because loons nest on fresh water, and fresh water is a tough thing to be on in the wintertime because it's frozen solid. So uh, a loon's yearly cycle is dictated by when is it going to get cold out here? When can I get the heck out of this freshwater lake before it freezes over? Where am I going to go? I'm going to go to the ocean, which never freezes. So loons in Maine bounce between freshwater and saltwater. Um, they are mostly in place by now. Loons, because they have to fight for their territory in the spring, especially male loons, get the heck up onto, onto thawing ponds as soon as they can. So right now there are lots of loons as far inland as they can find open water. There's also a lot of loons that stay on salt water all year round. It takes loons a couple of years to become adults. And so they spend just, they just hang out on salt water. So loons are mig migrating right now, now too. Uh, this is how this is a, a map of loon nesting in Maine. You can see tons of them clustered along the coast in the wintertime, and then they just spread all over the state in the summer. Raptors migrate. <laughs> this is a broad winged hawk, a very beautiful little small hawk nests in the forests of Maine. You can see their wintering grounds all the way down through Central America and the Andes down here. 
Um, I am the Caribbean. They're sort of a, there's a, they, they are a very abundant bird. Let's see how these guys go. Ready? One, two, three. So here we go. March, April, boosh, coming across. June, July, they nest in the forest. They're quiet during the summertime in the East Coast and they all flood down. There's a, a much greater population of them and other raptors come along this inland area around Southern Texas and especially down through Central America. Raptors don't love to be caught over open water. They migrate generally during the day, unlike uh, passerine migrants instead of at night. Uh, and so they use thermals. And so they need to stick to the land more than the other birds do. And so there's a lot more of them that migrate over land rather than over the water like that wood thrush was doing. Um, here, uh, for other raptors, they don't mind going over the water. Ospreys, of course, are back. I saw my first at that, is it called Taste of Maine restaurant? That big one uh, up on Route 1, just north of uh, uh, Bath. Um, uh, two of them are on the nest. They are another one of our earliest migrants um, because they're so adaptable, right? They don't, they love the water. They can stay over the ocean. They can come up early whenever they want to. Um, and you can see here are some tagged ospreys, um, uh, how they go. And this is, these numbers here are the days. And so they just cruise. It takes them six days to have a nice leisurely stroll down through Florida over the Caribbean and down into deep, you know, the deep Amazon and different parts of, of, uh, of Central America. Uh, South America. Um, pretty cool for an entrees. But for us, they're coming back. Yes. Um, this is uh, early March. You can see just we are cranking up to the top right now. Here we are. We're about this week right now. So ospreys are flooding back in. Yes, this is the time to be alive. Um, not all birds migrate. Okay. Um, the ones that stay here in Maine in the winter are the ones that don't need to eat insects. So the big reason that all these birds are doing this that all these warblers and thrushes and things are migrating up is because we have delicious insect food for them to eat. So as Maine greens up and heats up, all of the insects come out, caterpillars are bouncing around, flies, spiders, you name it. And all that stuff is incredible food for birds, for baby birds, especially. So all these tiny little fist sized birds that are wintering down in Central and South America are like, well, I know it's a long flight and it's pretty dangerous, but I think it's worth it because if I go up there, I can get a, there's a lot of territory and a lot of delicious insects for me to feed my babies. Caterpillars are the best. The number one source of food for baby birds. So if you're, if you're, if you're a bird and you're going to have some, you're laying some eggs, you want to raise these babies, you want to feed them caterpillars because caterpillars are the best thing you can give them. And it makes sense too, right? In the springtime, there's tons of caterpillars on the landscape. They are easy to catch. They are little protein burritos that you can feed to your babies and it helps them grow up big and strong. Um, caterpillars are by far the most important thing that you can feed to babies. Um, and birds need a lot of them. So there have been studies done of just how many caterpillars it takes to raise a clutch of chickadees. So this is a Carolina chickadee from the Southern US, not our black -head chickadee. When it's game time, when it's time to get these baby birds from their fledgling stage or from their chicks to when they can fly on their own and feed on their own, all the parent chickadees are doing is going back and forth and feeding them, chick, uh, feeding them caterpillars. Th between 350 and 570 caterpillars per day for more than two weeks. That's thousands of caterpillars just for one clutch of chickadees, a tiny little chickadee, right? Tiny bird. Imagine the, all the other birds that nest in your yard, all the chickadees out there, all the bigger birds that need even more food. Um, it's very important to have enough insects and caterpillars for these birds to raise their young. That's how they do it. Even birds that we don't think of rely on insects. This, and I hope you're all sitting down for this because this is going to blow your mind. If you had to get, we all know that hummingbirds eat, drink nectar from flowers, of course, but they also eat insects. Did you know that? And if I were to tell you what percentage of uh, insects are in a hummingbird's diet, what would you say? 10%, 5%, 75% insects, 75%. They really need that protein that's in live insects. And they, what they do, since they're so good at hovering in place, they hover in front of spider webs. Spiders are their main insect uh, meals. They sit there, the spiders are like, oh, I got nothing for this. They get plucked out of there and eaten. And then guess what the hummingbirds do? They grab the nest, they grab the web. They grab the web and then use it to hold their nest together. Pretty cool. Uh, hummingbirds are, uh, are the like apex predator of, uh, of spiders. Okay. 
we're going to have caterpillars in our yards, not itchy, annoying caterpillars, but like moths and things that are beneficial and great. How are we going to get them? What's it going to do? We got to plant native plants. Native plants are the number one best way that you can bring the caterpillars to your yard that birds need to survive. Um, I don't need to go into the whole, but there's an evolutionary arms race between plants and caterpillars where uh, insects eat plants, plants don't want to get eaten. So plants develop these defenses to try to keep insects off them. Insects develop ways around those defenses and they go back and forth. And what you end up with is, is specialization often where certain insects are specialized to the plants because they can figure out the defenses of that plant, but they haven't figured out the, the they spent so much effort on that one plant that they haven't figured out the defenses of the other plants. Um, that's not the case for everyone. These are two plants here that are native to Maine that host a wide variety of beneficial caterpillars. That's the red oak and a black cherry right there. These are two of the best plants that you could put in your yard if you want to support a whole bunch, but others need specific plants. Monarch caterpillars are the greatest example, right? Um, monarch uh, milkweed, you need milkweed to have monarchs. They have this relationship. Milkweed is poisonous to just about everything. It has that milky substance there that can uh, make you sick, make animals sick, lots of things sick. But uh, monarch caterpillars have evolved this like special sodium pump in their bodies that can allow them to digest the, the toxins. They also have other special ways. Sometimes you'll see monarch caterpillars like clipping that the end of the stem here on the leaf and that like makes the makes some of the poison drip out before it can uh, get out to the rest of the leaf and that way there's there's fewer poisons so they have ways to do it but it means that monarchs have evolved to eat milkweed they can't eat anything else right so if you eliminate milkweed then you're going to eliminate monarchs and as you probably heard a lot of the uh, uh milkweed around the country is being eliminated um and uh Monarchs are going with it. So plant some in your yard, you're gonna have monarchs. Monarchs are the best, who doesn't want that? Um, where can you get some info on how to plant uh, native plants? Um, you, you can do it on our website, Maine Audubon, um, uh, our native plant project. You can do it from the National Audubon Society, their native plant database. You can go to the Wild Seed Project. You can do all kinds of different things to figure out what plants are gonna work for your yard, in the shade and the whatever you've got in your yard um, and figure out a great native plant yard. So. Um, that's one important takeaway from this presentation is we get ready for spring right now. Uh, what can I put in my yard to make it, it as good for uh, birds as possible? Oops, I shouldn't do that to move that around. What's another tip? This is important. Okay. Bird feeding, right? You can feed birds. It's fine to do. I do it all the time. Um, bird, feeding birds is great. Um, it helps to know what you're doing. Um, you're putting out seed generally. Like I just said, insects are the main important reason that birds are coming up right now. So right down, now, this time of year, you have a lot of birds getting food from seed, but it's not the, it's not the important food source, food source they need to feed their babies. Birds don't feed seeds to their babies. They feed insects. But they also eat other things, including seed. And so putting seed out is great. But there's an important thing to know as you're going to the store to buy bird seed, which is that there is a big old scam out there in the world, which is that seed companies like to fill bags with a seed that birds don't eat called Milo. Milo is, uh, I think it's sorghum. It's a, it's a seed that produces sorghum. And it looks for all the world like any other seed. It looks all, for all the world like something that birds would eat, but they don't eat it, except for maybe morning doves and turkeys. Um, but seed companies are like, especially unscrupulous ones, not naming any names, will fill their bags with up to 75%, according to this um, test from the Washington Post, up to 75% Milo. Complete waste of money. You're filling your bird's feeders with that Milo stuff. It comes, birds don't eat it, it sits there, it gets wet, it rots, it goes on your yard, you're throwing money away. Because when you, you say you buy 10 bucks for a, a thing of seed, you're getting $2.50 worth of seed for that. So my tip to you all, this spring, as you are feeding birds or any time of year, don't buy a bird seed bag that has Milo in it. You can look on the ingredients on the back. They have to list everything that's in there. If it says Milo, don't buy it, okay? Other than that, everything is great. I prefer um, sunflower seeds, especially ones without shells. That's the least messy. Uh, the most types of birds eat it. Um, but it's also important this time of year to think about other types of food that birds eat, right? 
It's not just seeds. And one of the joys of uh, you know improving your backyard habitat is that there's all kinds of different things you can put back there to attract different birds. Oh man, Orioles, Baltimore Orioles. Who doesn't want to look in their backyard and see a group of six, five Baltimore Orioles munching back there? You can do it, you can do it easily. Um, what I do is you can do this. They love grape jelly. Don't know why. It's fruit. They like fruit, sugary fruit. Um, you can do grape jelly. It works great. Uh, you know, if you don't have a time to put up this sort of uh, thing, you can do what I do, which works even better, which you take an orange, an orange, cut it in half, right? You got a half an orange. You stick that orange onto a branch or something. So it's, so the flat part is sticking out. Birds come in and, and uh, Orioles, Love that stuff. Orioles and catbirds, and sometimes some other birds, um, sometimes tanagers, um, go crazy for that half an orange. And I, I'm, let me tell you, when you when you've seen enough, you know, tit mice and and house sparrows at your feeders to get a Baltimore Oriole back there is pretty awesome. They are coming in mid May or so, early to mid May, and so you've got some time to get ready for that. But they're coming, and that's going to make your your backyard much better. Hummingbirds, of course, we can feed them too. The best way to feed hummingbirds. Uh, is with by planting the plants they need or having a bunch of spiders back there. Um, there are tons of native flowers that hummingbirds eat. And I, and I tell you, a picture of a hummingbird in your backyard is much cooler when it's drinking out of a natural flower than a, than a, or, than a red piece of plastic, but red pieces of plastic work too. Um, what I will say, the tip for hummingbird feeders is that it doesn't matter. You don't buy the red stuff, the red liquid stuff that you pour in there. Don't buy it. You don't need it. Birds don't care about the color of the liquid. They are looking at those yellow flat fake flowers there. That's what they are in here for. Um, and the red food coloring in that red stuff might actually be harmful for hummingbirds and that's no good. So don't do that. What you do instead is boil four parts water with one part white sugar, plain white sugar, not the sugar in the raw, not any fancy sugars, just plain white table sugar or whatever it's called uh, uh, and use that instead. That way it, uh, it's much cheaper and works better for the birds. Good, put those bird, uh, hummingbird feeders out. Again, they will be here early May. A lot of birds, the reason early May is, is a, the, the prime time for a lot of these birds that rely on insects is because they need to be sure that they're gonna insects here when they get here, right? So they it, it, some birds that eat that are sort of omnivorous, like the, the grackles that are here now, the ospreys that can eat fish on the ocean, they're like, I, I can go up earlier because I know my food is going to be there. But if you are dependent on insects, we don't, you know, it's sort of hit and miss. Um, those Phoebes, the flycatchers, are sort of uh, the, the first guard for that, tree swallows as well. Um, and so there are insect eating birds that are here now, but the bulk of them are like, I need to wait to make sure that there's going to be some warmth in Maine before I get up there. So that's why it's like May instead of April for some of these birds. And then down at the bottom, suet. Suet is rendered fat, packed together in a little cake. Sometimes there's different seeds and stuff put in it. Um, lots of birds love that stuff. It's a great energy source, woodpeckers especially. So you can hang some suet um, somewhere in your yard and get a whole bunch of woodpeckers like that. Uh, downy, I'm gonna go downy for that woodpecker. It's a tough one. Um, what else, what else? Now is the time, April 7th. Now is the time to put birdhouses outside. Now's the time. Do it now. Don't wait. Um, birds are here and they are starting to look for places to put their nests. Not all birds nest in bird boxes, but some do. The ones that nest in bird boxes are the ones that naturally nest in tree cavities. That's what a bird box is. It's a mimic of a tree cavity. Um, humans have cut down a lot of the trees that, uh, you know, the dead snags. Um, that birds traditionally would put their put their cavity nests in. And so what bird boxes are is basically uh, replicating that out on the environment, right? Um, but they're, they're, they are starting to look now. So let's get that stuff out of there. I will give you one important tip before you go, if you want to have a successful nest box season, which is do a little bit of research before you do it. Birds are often very particular about how their cavity, how their bird box is set up. And that could be the size of the hole. That could be the way it's facing. That could be how high off the ground it is. That could be what else is around it. And so if you want to have a particular species, you want to have a chickadee or you want to have a gray crested flycatcher, you want to have an eastern bluebird, it pays to do a little bit of research before you hang the thing up to figure out where you should hang it, how you should hang it, what it should look like. There's a great website from the Cornell Lab of Ornithology <coughs> called Nest, Nest Watch. 
where you can go in there, you can type in the species that you want, and it'll tell you the requirements you need as you put your bird box out. It's great, and I highly recommend it. And it'll, it may make the difference between you getting uh, a cool bird to nest in your box or a bird like a house sparrow that, or a starling that is less exciting uh, uh, from that perspective. So nest watch, go check it out, figure out how you're gonna hang your uh, birdhouses up. Okay, we're gonna transition now into a bit of a, bit of a different tone, okay? This is, what I was, this is what I was hired to do. This is why they brought me in. We'll go back to this slide a little bit. So every year, spring and fall, we have billions of birds moving north and south over the United States. There are more birds in the fall than there are in spring. You know why? Because they had babies. So in the fall, all these birds, these newborns, these young birds are flying for the first time thousands of miles in the dark to someplace south. It's pretty crazy. So for, for millennia, for thousands of years, these birds have flown at night generally because uh, there's less wind, there's fewer predators out, they can use the stars for navigation. Every night during spring and fall migration, millions of birds are flying through the air, uh, moving between their breeding grounds and their wintering grounds. And for millions of years, so thousands of years, the United States that they flew over looked a certain way, right? It looked a certain way at night. Just in the last couple hundred years, it does not look that same way. So these birds, which have evolved for thousands of years to fly over a dark country, using the stars and flying to, you know, uh, open habitats, cleared, you know, uh, you know, virgin wilderness, are now faced with something very different just in the past couple hundred years. Um, this is what the United States looks like now for a migrating bird, um, full of lights and sounds and infrastructure, right? And that means a lot of different things for them. For a lot of birds, it means flying into buildings. There didn't used to be buildings, you know? There didn't used to be buildings a couple hundred years ago. Just weren't there. Now, as birds are moving through, they are encountering structures that they never had to before and figuring out how to deal with it. They evolved in a world that didn't have any of this stuff. Um, the way it works generally is it takes a couple of days for birds to, to migrate the full distance, sometimes weeks, et cetera. They fly at night, they may encounter weather, they may encounter whatever, you know, wind. Um, in the, when the dawn comes up, they say, I gotta get out of the sky and I wanna be caught out in the open when the predators wake up. So they come down to refuel and wait out the day in safety um, and, and then wait for nightfall again to start migrating. Um, they don't get to choose where they go, right? So they migrate and then they'll get knocked down and wherever they come down is where they are. That used to be fine. They would be hit the trees wherever they are, but now sometimes they land over a city. And they come down into a city or they come down into a built part of the built environment. And suddenly they're thrust into this world that is uh, way different than it was um, a couple hundred years ago, right? They are faced with this <clears throat> in part. This is um, a big glass window that is an absolute trick for birds. Um, a bird has no idea what this is, uh, no idea what to do with it. <clears throat> this giant glass building is reflecting the sky. For a bird, this looks like the sky, right? Here's a big set of windows that is reflecting habitat and vegetation. A lot of these birds are trying to move to safety from vegetation to vegetation throughout the day. And they are trying to stay low and out of sight. As birds are darting between different places of vegetation, they see this and they say, let's go for it. I'll just dive into that. They hit a glass wall. Um, a lot of, it, of this is due to how birds have evolved, right? Um, very often the birds that collide the most are smaller birds, prey birds, for lack of a better term. Um, this white-throated sparrow on the left there, he evolved uh, uh, eyes on the sides of its head so we could look out for predators, right? He needs to look, you know, he needs to be aware of things coming after him. So his eyes are out here, which allows him to, uh, better vision. Um, or well, uh, uh, whatever the word is I'm looking for. Um, owls and other predators, for, on the other hand, um, don't need to look out for anything. They need to figure out how to get on their prey. So they have evolved like humans, eyes on the front of their head, which gives them good depth perception to dive onto their prey. What it means is that uh, birds like this white-throated sparrow don't, so when you have your vision that goes like this, you have a bit of a blind spot right here. And so these birds are already at a disadvantage when it comes to understanding what a window is 
because they just don't see that well right in front of their faces. In addition to being reflective, glass is also transparent, especially at night. Um, I was introduced to this work when I uh, lived in Washington, DC. I volunteered for a group called Lights Out DC when I was down there and we walked around Washington, DC, spring and fall migration to try to find birds that had struck buildings. Um, this was one of the deadliest that we found. Um, this is the Thurgood Marshall Judiciary Building uh, near Union Station. Uh, it's these like two buildings connected by this big glass atrium, um, which is reflected during the day, but also at night is completely lit up from within. Uh, and the tree, they planted these bamboo trees, whatever those are, um, right in the middle. And so if you're a migratory bird, you're flying in, you're looking for a place to hang out, those places are beckoning to you and we would find lots of birds uh, against this uh, building uh, every morning during migration. So glass is dangerous. There are lots of studies around the country, lots of groups around the country, like the Lights Out DC group that I work for, that are doing this, that are studying this problem. The bird building collision problem, uh, the awareness of it and the, our understanding of it has grown dramatically in the past decade. To the point now where we know that between 365 million and 988 million birds per year die by colliding into glass, 988 million. That is on the low estimate of a million birds a day, right? Are crashing into windows and dying. Um, we know a lot, we know that glass is the main culprit. So the number one factor about how dangerous a building is, is um, how much glass is on the facade, right? Um, we know a lot about which species are hitting, why they're hitting, what times they're hitting, and learning a lot about uh, safety, and how to improve things. Um, I have started, based on my experiences with Lights Out DC, a group in Maine called a Bird Safe Maine, which is a collaboration between us and the University of Southern Maine and the Portland Society for Architecture, which is doing work to, uh, we, we have started over the past, uh, this is where we are in our third year now, um, over the past two and a half years, of walking a route like I used to in Washington DC, walking a route to see if the principles that we know about how bird strikes happen in urban areas are also applying to Portland. So we walk a route during spring and fall migration every morning at dawn and try to find birds on the sidewalk. And we're trying to understand do birds hit in Portland and do birds hit against buildings that we think they're going to, which is buildings with a lot of glass. The answer unequivocally after two and a half years is yes and yes. So we have found hundreds of birds on the streets of Portland more than 50 different species. We solicit uh, other bird strikes from around the country. It's not just an urban problem, but during migration, when birds are on the move and find themselves over cities, it's, it's more pronounced in cities. And so that's why we can see it. Um, but we found we've, uh, we are aware of strikes all over the state um, and in Portland. And we know that they are striking more often against all glass buildings. So um, Bird Safe Maine is now continuing to do our route walking. And we are about to start on April 18th. If anyone is interested in getting some great exercise on various mornings this spring, um, once a week, um, come walk a route with us and other, other volunteers looking for birds. Uh, we'd love to have you. Um, we are uh, doing that. We're also pushing for policy solutions. I'll talk about that in a second. The good thing about this problem is that it's very easy to fix, right? We can build our buildings in a way that makes them less susceptible to bird collisions. All you need to do is give birds an indication that there's a window there and not an invisible reflection or whatever. Um, there are tons of ways to do this. Um, I won't go through the whole list of different ways that, that architects are now learning on how to build bird safe, but in your home, there are plenty of easy ways to do it. You could put out some simple decals. Um, they look much less obvious actually in place than on this image. This is to sort of show you what it can look like. But um, there are these dots that serve to break up the reflection for a bird. They avoid this window. Um, from within, your eye naturally sort of um, absorbs these dots and you barely see them at all. You don't see them. We have some on our windows at Gills and Farm, our uh, Audubon headquarters in Falmouth. Um, you can check out. These are from Feather Friendly. This is a product we recommend. Um, a lot of people, even seasonally, will put um, parachute cord outside their windows. Um, this is a, a product called the Copian Bird Savers that work. There's tons of insect screens. The screens that we all put on our windows uh, in the summertime to keep bugs from flying in um, are one of the best solutions you can get. 
uh, birds, uh, that it works as a perfect screen. Um, there's lots of other things you can do at your windows to make them um, bird safe. What else can you do? <clears throat> Graphic design is my passion. And I came up with this slide on my own. Um, you can help us monitor bird strikes in Maine. This would be great. Um, we take solicitations. If you have a bird that has injured itself or met its end against a window at your home, please let us know. We are trying to keep track of all the species um, and data points we can. So if you if this happens to you and you find bird, um, take a picture, uh, send it to me at birdstrike at mainaudubon.org. Uh, includes whatever information you can, and I will add it to our database. Um, this is helping out a lot. You can also improve the safety of the windows at your house, right? Um, like I said, there's lots of different products on the market. Um, we sell them at Gills and Farm in Falmouth. There's a ton of them available online from places like uh, Collide Escape and Feather Friendly. The best resource online currently is the American Bird Conservancy website, abcbirds.org. They, have, they are the leading product tester for all these different bird safe products that are coming on the market. And you can find links to buy them and do all kinds of stuff there. abcbirds.org uh, can help you get ideas for how to treat your windows at home. But you can also uh, push for policy solutions. We are excited um, that the work that we've been doing for the past two and a half years is, is making steady progress um, into real policy solutions. Right now, currently, there is a bill in front of the legislature from the state and local government committee called LD 670, introduced by Representative Warren from Scarborough, uh, which would put Maine in just one of three states so far that has taken statewide action on bird safe uh, architecture. It's a really simple, straightforward bill. All it would ask at this point is that the state uh, develop guidelines that could, could be used, are not required yet, but could be used in public buildings to avoid bird strikes. One thing we found in the architect, you know, in, in, in studying this stuff is that it's way easier and way cheaper to protect birds if you start from before a project is built. So if you have a giant glass building, it's all built, birds are flying into it and dying, you can retrofit that building. You can do it but it's much more labor intensive, much more expensive at the end of the day to do it after it's built than before it's built. So what we're trying to do is develop guidelines that can be used before buildings are being built or when additions are being put on that require people to think about bird safety before they go. This will reduce bird safety. It will be, it's no more expensive than building a regular building any other way. Um, and it's a great way to sort of um, get the architectural community to start thinking about this early. So, um, LD670 uh, had a public hearing on March 31st um, and uh, had a work session yesterday. This is the timing is not perfectly. The work session was frustratingly not publicly announced, um, but, uh, but we're still working on this. Um, the best thing to do here is to connect with mainaudubon.org slash policy to sign up for our action alerts, action alerts to get uh, alerted when something's happening on this bill. Cool. We're also working in the city of Portland. Um, a lot of the policy um, happening on bird safe stuff is happening at the municipal level. And there are about two dozen or so uh, cities around the country that have passed bird safe ordinances, including some big ones like New York City and Washington, DC. And we have a draft ordinance with the city right now that we are working on finalizing and are getting to next steps of public participation as soon as this month or next month on um, on an ordinance that would put uh, that would do a similar thing, require buildings to be bird safe. Um, so we're really excited about that. We don't have anything quite to share just yet, but uh, if you come to mainaudubon.org slash advocacy, I can help you out and we'll get there. So I look forward to seeing you. I was talking very fast during the whole thing, but I'm gonna stop now with 15 minutes left. That's a good time. And take any questions that folks might have. About anything, about bird safe, about spring migration, um, about birds that you might see in your backyard, um, about uh, whatever. And I can see some that I have um, in the uh, in my questions here. Before right, you from... dive into them, Nick, you have to give me a chance oh. to say how much I love your energy and your passion. And I just thank you so much for, for sharing everything with us about the, the happy 
little bird families and all their little caterpillars and all those cute little pictures and the serious stuff too, because we want to do everything we can to protect those little guys. Uh, everybody will get a follow-up email later this afternoon with the link to this recording and also some links to Bird Safe Maine, to Maine Audubon, and so that you can you know, sign up uh, sign a petition to support that legislative proposal that that Nick was just talking about, and keep all of the uh, the conversation and the good work going. Um, okay, I have a few too. So let me. Okay, you want me to read the ones that were? I don't. I'm not sure if you're seeing these direct messages uh, also, but I will. From Kate says, all grape jelly is not created equal. Please avoid high fructose corn syrup, which is also Ooh. bad for humans. Good point. Get a good get a good old grape jelly. Make it yourself, maybe too. Um, great comment from Ian. Thank you. I'll reach out. He was a volunteer for Lights Out Cleveland. Awesome work, um, Cleveland. I would love to talk to you, Ian, about how that went at some point. Um, Cleveland, there on the on the lake. Um, I'm really interested to hear how uh, how birds came in over the lake down there. I'll catch up. I'll catch up with you. Awesome. Um, Deborah says that she uses a paracord called Zen curtains, which are mesmerizing, um, to help break up the reflection on her window. Fantastic. Um, we are, um, there's a lot of cool ways uh, involving cords and things to protect your windows. I just got off, um, I've been working with Saddleback Mountain up there in the mountains. Um, they are building a new lodge up high in some sensitive bird habitat and have been working with us since the beginning on some bird safe solutions. And they are doing a cool uh, corded screen thing that can be moved and removed um, up there. And so we're excited about that. So cords work. Um, the, the, the most famous one is the Copian bird savers. Um, and there are, there are plenty of other ways to do it uh, cheaply and effectively. Um, Will asks what my favorite color is. What a great question. I think it's blue. Um, that's, but I feel lame saying that because I feel like I haven't put a lot of thought into that. And um, I don't know, maybe there are some other better colors out there. Any other questions? I have a couple. I have a Hit couple. Me. Hit me. When you said that we should be getting ready to put our bird houses out right now, that's perhaps the first time it ever occurred to me to take them that there might have been a moment that I should have taken them down. Can you just yeah tell me what I tell me what I missed and what I need to do if they've just been hanging sure. in trees for years? You don't need to take them down. Um, some if if you are thinking about putting up a new one, then you can. That's I guess what I was referring to. But you're right. That's a great question. Um, you don't need to take your your birdhouses down. You know, again, these things are mimicking natural natural tree cavities, which stay out there all year and are subject to whatever is out there. Um, sometimes these birdhouses are actually beneficial in the winter, as insects and different things will will hibernate in there or basically try to ride out the winter. And so th there's a benefit to having that sort of safe, out of the way space. Um, and birds are used to that, right? So birds are birds are not necessarily, you know, uh, uh, expecting a fresh uh, uh, hole. They prefer a fresh hole, I think. And one of the things you can do, especially one of the things they recommend when you are putting up a chickadee house is that you sprinkle some sawdust at the bottom, which I think is supposed to mimic a fresh woodpecker hole, right? Because they sort of clawed out. A lot of the cavities that exist are holes that woodpeckers dug either to find food or to nest themselves. Um, and so I think that's what they're trying to do with chickadees. So that's a, that's a way to do it too. But you also, um, you can clean them out. Some people clean them out um, in the winter, not necessary, totally. Um, but um, um, there are, are a variety of ways to do it. And if some little other creature, like a red squirrel perhaps has made it, is it just a lost cause? Will birds never go back there? I don't want to fight with a red squirrel. Those I things, don't either. That's, I'm not why, I'm not that's why they're in that birdhouse. Yeah. Cause you know, <laughs> yeah. what am I going to do about it? Look, nests are nests um, and everybody needs a place to go. Um, and um you can excavate things if you want to. You know, some people have um, problems with specific birds. You know, there are birds like um, uh, Eurasian, uh, European starlings or, or house sparrows that are, you know, whatever. They're birds on the landscape. They've been here for a long time, but they are not native to Maine uh, until, you know, a, hundred, a couple of years ago. So some people prefer to have different species and you can um, do what you want. 
Um, but um, really the best way to, to prevent the species you don't want is to start um, making sure that the whole, the things are the right size before you put it up to make sure that the right birds will use it. I got a couple of other questions in here too. Um, Elizabeth lives way down east and usually sees ospreys on the St. Croix River, but uh, the chart only show them coming halfway along Maine. Interesting. Um, I, I think that migration was just the ones they tagged, Elizabeth. And so I don't think they tagged ospreys that live further north just because that was probably the study. But ospreys live uh, as far up as they can go. Ospreys are actually one of the few birds that lives on every continent except for Antarctica. Um, Great horned owl is another one, believe it or not. Um, but ospreys live everywhere that they can live. And thankfully, now that we banned DDT in the 60s, um, they are doing great. Um, so um, I think that was just a fault of that, of that chart. Rebecca, book recommendations for kids 7 to 10 about bird safe issues and migration. Great question. Um, I can recommend my recent book, the ABA Field Guide to the Birds of Maine, um, out as of a year ago. It's a lovely field guide. Um, you know, that's a great question. I don't know of any books that are specifically talking about bird safe or migration. I'm sure they're out there, um, but I can't say that I know any off the top of my head. Um, um, let me know if you find some, uh, either on a search somehow or, or another one. Um, Nick says, we have heard that you should clean up the bird feed that falls on the ground due to potential, potential health issues. Great question. Um, you should keep your feeders clean to the extent possible. Um, uh, especially if your seed gets wet, it can get moldy, just like anything, any grain that gets wet. And molds can mean bad things for birds, of course. Um, especially if you have those tube feeders where there's some seed that's stuck at the bottom that's been there for a long time, that can get really gross and bad. You should absolutely clean that out uh, if you can. Um, the seed that falls on the ground is less of a health issue in that way than it is an issue for potentially rodents and mice and things. Um, those, uh, there's really no question that mice and, and whatever will eat seed that falls on the ground. That's why I recommend a lot is the, the shelled, um, the, the least amount of mess you can produce is the best way. When you can get sunflower seeds that where the, the black shells have been taken off and it's just the meat, as they say, that stuff is gobbled up and there's nothing left over. Um, right now, I'm, someone gifted me a bag of seed that I'm, I'm going through and it's a, it's, it's a mess. There's shells and stuff everywhere. I don't really mind, um, but, um, but I prefer the other stuff. I will say that there are a whole suite of birds that actually prefer eating off the ground, sparrows, than taking it from the feeders. So, um, you know, e eating from a bird feeder is kind of dangerous, right? You're, you're sitting there and your head is down as you're eating and you're exposed to potential uh, birds coming in, predation. Um, and so putting some feed on the seed on the ground actually encourages birds to feel safer down there. So a lot of sparrows, I know the song sparrows and the juncos that are in my backyard right now, or the fox sparrows that are moving through right now, prefer to eat off the ground than they do off the feeder. Um, and so I wouldn't worry about the health issues um, there. Um, Nick, can I ask you, I, I've heard that um, if you're not gonna feed, if you're not gonna fill your bird feeders religiously, and throughout the year that you shouldn't do it. Hmm. Not true. But, okay, thank you. Because I really want to do, I want to get the oracles and all the things you said. I don't, but I'm yeah. probably not going to do it every Bir day. Birds, no, except for when they breed, not to put all their eggs in one basket. When they breed, they put them all in one basket. It's literally opposite of what. But when it comes to feeding, they don't rely on one food source. So you're backyard bird feeder is not the only spot a bird gets his food. And I would love to see like, I don't know, I'm sure this exists, but like uh, a tracker, you know, put, put a little tracker on a chickadee and see where, see the route it has in your neighborhood, because they know that, you know, things go away or, or something happens. And so if you leave on vacation, if you do stuff, it's not a problem at all. You can feed when you want and not when you want. Um, birds, the birds will be fine. Um, Tori asked, does bird safe glass really work? Specifically the glass that has lines crisscrossed throughout only if you're at the right angle. Great question. She mentions a, a, a building at the University of New England. So there's lots of different solutions for bird safe glass. Some work better than others. And the trade-off in a lot of times is how much does the architect think that this solution is gonna like mess up the view? 
One of the solutions out there that architects love the most is called is ultraviolet glass. So birds can see light, most birds can see light in the ultraviolet spectrum. Humans can't. And so if you are to layer a piece of glass with ultraviolet strips or patterns, a bird can see that and sees that as a, a solid thing, but a human doesn't see anything. It looks like just like a regular window. And so the thinking there is that this is the ultimate solution. This is perfect for birds, perfect for humans. Trouble is it doesn't work that great. Um, in different lighting conditions, if there's harsh light morning or night, if there's fog, if there's other things, the, the ultraviolet sort of doesn't stand out that much and it doesn't work as well as some other solutions. Um, the American Bird Conservancy does all the testing for these products and they assign a threat factor to each potential solution. The higher the threat factor, the least, the less safe it is. So a, like a brick wall has a threat factor of one because it's the safest thing. It's birds, there's no reflection. Um, ultraviolet glass is somewhere up in the middle. It, it works in some conditions, doesn't work as well as some other solutions. And so bird safe main, we actually don't really recommend using ultraviolet glass. It's also by far the most expensive solution. And so that turns a lot of architects off. Um, so we don't really recommend it, but it, it can work in certain situations and it is better than a, a window with no treatment at all. Nick, if we don't see birds at the base of our windows, does that mean we're okay? Uh, we don't need to do any of this stuff? It's hard to know. The answer is no, but it's hard to know. Um, part of the reason that this problem has sort of escaped, it, it's just really rising now, is that we've gotten a lot better at detecting it, at understanding it, studying it directly. If you're not at, at your window, if, you're, if I'm down here in my basement right now and a bird hits upstairs, I don't see it, it falls into a bush, it gets eaten by rodents or ants or something, I never know that it happened. Um, everyone has stories of, he, of being there to hear a bird strike and that's when you're there to hear it. Um, but we're realizing until these, these surveys came down, Lights Out DC, Lights Out Cleveland, uh, Fatal Light Awareness Project in Toronto is when we first, um, we didn't really realize the full extent of how birds were striking until we actually uh, saw it. And so, it doesn't mean that birds are striking your window necessarily. We're learning there's a lot to it about how your window is situated, what is nearby, things like that. But it doesn't mean they're not either. Um, and it's really hard to tell. Um, the best way that people know is that if you do hear, if you hear a strike, that's probably meaning there's a lot more strikes that you're not hearing. And so um, that could be a window that you could consider treating. And we've been talking a lot about the ways we can be we can act on our concern for birds. How concerned do we need to be about some of the birds that may be visiting, um, especially those eagles and especially those of us who have pets on the smaller side? <laughs> um, look, pets are, look like a delicious snack. Um, eagles, you don't have to worry about. Um, you don't really have to worry about much. Um, but there are certain uh, raptors out there, especially, um, that their whole thing is is sniping little mammals off the ground. That's their whole deal. I'm thinking specifically about um, a set of hawks called Budio hawks, which include red-tailed hawks, include uh, broadwing hawks, red-shouldered, uh, not, uh, yeah, red-shouldered. Um, these are hawks that, that sit on, uh, these are the ones you see as you're driving 295, you see them sitting on the side. They are sitting there because they're looking down in the grass for, for rodents and things. Um, it's a very uncommon, but I guess it is possible if you had a little chihuahua running around on the side of 295 that uh, a red tail could, could come down and snap it. Um, coyotes and things are probably much more of a risk. Um, bald eagles, you don't really need to worry about it. Bald eagles barely take any live prey anyway. They are they are really scavengers. Or they harass uh, ospreys. Ospreys are only are fish only. Don't need to worry about them. Um, and so I wouldn't worry about it. Um, but um, but I don't know. Maybe just keep your keep your eyes open. All right. One more question. You mentioned um, that that we should send pictures, information to that bird safe email. Is bird safe just 
looking at Portland right now, or do you want to know from, from other parts of the state as well? Anywhere in the state. So we have the focus route walking in Portland only because that's close to where we live and we want that's where we were starting. Um, but it's, you know, it's definitely a problem in other urban areas in Maine, no question. We get reports from Bangor, Lewiston, but we also want to know anywhere in the state. So we take any residents, any, any, you know, if you're walking down the street and see one anywhere, we want to know because we want to learn about what buildings are, how widespread of a problem this is, what species it is. And so we, um, we, we do all that kind of stuff. That's a great answer because it means every single one of us can be, be part of this solution. And um, I know I, I, I'm guessing I can speak for quite a few people on the, the call when I say we're excited to after that fabulous presentation. Thank you so much, Nick. Thanks to everybody for joining us today. We are going to be off next Friday, but we will be back in this space on April 21st for a really interesting program exploring how different approaches to mapping can help us uncover history. So mm. you will get information about that in the follow-up email as well. Until then, happy birding. Have a fabulous weekend and thank you all. Bye everyone. Thank you.